uh, 4.32 in the afternoon. <sighs> yeah. So very happy afternoon and a big welcome to all of you wonderful ladies and gentlemen out there on this second virtual classroom session organized by Credai in collaboration with IM Bangalore. My name is Abhishek Mehta and I'm part of the Credai National Content Committee who are interested with the precarious job of curating all the content that comes into your hands under the leadership of our Honorable President, Sri Shatish Magar. These specially curated faculty lecture series are focused towards equipping today's entrepreneurs with the right skill set to rebound from the ongoing COVID crisis, hence aptly named Real Estate Bootcamp Ready to Rise. These lectures will have concrete and real takeaways that delegates can implement immediately in their respective businesses. Another objective of this series is to give you a sneak preview into the content and faculty of the business leadership program conducted annually by IAM Bangalore for Credai. I have personally been a student of this program and can vouch without any hesitation that this has been the single biggest pivotal moment of my life as a professional real estate developer. I would like to thank the faculty at IAM Bangalore for that, and also all the seniors at Kredai who have toiled hard to get that partnership going, especially Sri Balakrishna Ji Hegde. Thank you, sir. Learning is never, learning is a never ending process, a habit that leads to growth. That which does not grow over a period of time eventually dies. As an entrepreneur, we grow in our, in our endeavors every time. We often come to a point that we need to hire a person with completely new skill sets. Many a time, we don't even know how to interview the person for those skill sets. Many a time, we have to hire a person smarter than us, and yet we want complete control. In our ambition to grow fast and strong, many times we end up hiring very senior executives at very, very large pay scales who feign miserably to perform in our organizations. I call them gorillas. And yet we don't know why these gorillas really failed. Hence, in today's session, we shall be learning the tips and tricks on how to hire the right people for our organizations and how to avoid the pitfalls of hiring gorillas. Without further ado, I now call upon Professor Venki Pachapakeshan, who heads the Real Estate Research Initiative at IM Bangalore, to introduce today's faculty, Professor Vasanthi Srinivasan. Sure. Thank you, thank you very much, Abhishek. Uh, for a second, I thought I was in the classroom and you were the faculty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, welcome to all of you. I think um, um, I am Bangalore, the faculty at I am Bangalore, and myself. Uh, we are excited to be part of this um, initiative with Kredai. Um, we have today one of our star professors, Professor Vasanthi Srinivasan. Um, she is a professor in organization behavior and human resource management. Uh, she is one of uh, a very rare set of people who did their uh, PhD from IM Bangalore and is now a professor at IM Bangalore. So she has uh, been part of that community where, you know, the faculty were her faculty and then later on her colleague as well. Um, aside of uh, being a star teacher, and I think I, I have to say, I mean, you can ask uh, the students who are part of the Kredai program about the level of enthusiasm she brings into the classroom. Uh, she also does quite a bit of uh, additional work, which includes working with organizations like NASCOM, uh, trying to scale social enterprises, which is one of our uh, favorite uh, research interests right now. So I would say that um, one of the rare set of professors who combines uh, what is we call research and brings it into the classroom. So I'm very uh, excited to have Professor Vasanthi lead our second session for the Kredai community. And as uh, Abhishek mentioned, it is about how to hire people. Uh, in a typical classroom in IM Bangalore, if she had to be, if she was teaching this, 
there would have been a uh, preliminary session, which we usually call it as Chai Pe Charcha, you know, where she would uh, find a little bit more information from each one of you and then craft a session around it, which I, makes it very, very uh, powerful. Um, so, uh, but given that we are working in the COVID Zoom world, uh, some of those are not possible, but, uh, but I'm sure this, uh, the next one hour is going to fly and uh, all of you are going to be a lot better off understanding how it is to hire a team. And um, off to you, Professor Vasanthi. Thank you, Venki. And uh, as usual, it's such a pleasure to be uh, back here at the team. And since I won, how, um, how many uh, years I have spent on this program, and uh, it just seems like now uh, that uh, Mr. Hegde came and spoke about the need for this um, kind of uh, capacity building for the sector, and we were so delighted. And I must tell you that my own journey on understanding um, employees in the real estate sector has actually gone hand in hand with my teaching on Kridai. And it is through the numerous people who've been through my classes over the last several years that I have developed a lot of insights. Um, and, um, and, and interestingly, um, I, since uh, the uh, COVID lockdown, this must be the third time that I'm addressing the Kridai uh, participants because I address the alumni ones and then I address the current participants. And then so in some ways, um, when um, the team core team came and asked me to uh, work on this session, I was also wondering, well, how should I position this session? And I realized that all of these people have been in my class. So which means they were giving me inputs from what it means to be in my class and kind of pick up those ideas. But since I'm addressing a large number of you who've never been through my class and who therefore don't have a context to where I'm coming from, I thought I will just begin this session with a little bit of openness to be able to think through, okay? Uh, Abhishek, you have a task in hand because I'd like for the chat to open in a little while as I'm putting up this slide. Um, so I, I, if I need some help, I will call out to you. Okay. Sure, ma'am. Okay. So let me go with my slide. Um, my um, uh, session is going to be how to hire people better than you. But the interesting question is, why should I hire somebody better than me? And what happens when I hire somebody better than me? Because what if they learn all my trade secrets and they go and start their own business? Another one, if I hire people better than me, how will I manage them? Okay. Often over and over, I've heard entrepreneurs ask me this question for the 15 years that I have taught entrepreneurs at IM Bangalore. So if you are one of them who's kind of thinking about it, keep, keep this thought in your head for a little while, okay? So I'm now going to, so what is the focus of my session? I think this quote best captures for me. And sometimes these philosophers say things so beautifully that I could not have said better. So there are only three ways in which we learn. First is by reflection, which is where I am positioning today's session. I'm going to get you to reflect as entrepreneurs. The second is really imitation. So I hope as Kridai members, you know what each other is doing. And therefore, if there is something that's being done well, you ask yourself, say, what can I learn from that? And the last but not the least is experience, which means doing something and failing and learning from it. So my intention is that as entrepreneurs, are we reflecting about our businesses? So let's begin. And I thought I will use a slightly different uh, design. And then since there are several of you people who've been through my session, which means that I also have to be innovative. So I'm going to show you something and I'd like you to say what it is. Okay, so what is this? On the chat, can I see? What is this picture that's there? 
Abhishek, will I be able to see the chat? Yes, okay. ma'am. So, uh, um, home. Can the yeah. participants uh, feed in more? It's a home. Yes. Okay. Good. Anyone else? Okay. So let me show you the next picture. So what's the difference between the first one and the second one? The first is a house, second is a home. Okay. Any others? So what's the difference between these two? Second one is lively, okay? What's the first one? Would the participant, ah, first is bare, it could be empty. Second is with life. First one, yeah, Nick, that's an interesting one. First one is cold. The second one is green and there is life. Yeah. It looks like the grass home is being cared for, whereas the first one is brick and mortar. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Anything else? Anything else? Think about it. Very good. Absolutely in the right direction. So now let me make matters worse for you. What is this? Hotel. Absolutely. So the great. It's a hotel. So what's the difference between a house, a home, and a hotel? Is there any difference at all? What's the difference? Any thoughts? Okay, house and hotel, there's no attachment. Very interesting. The scale are different. At home, there is love. Home is for self-use. Excellent, excellent. Any others? Good. Keep going. First is a need. Second is a happiness. Third one is a luxury. Niranjan, that was really nice, really nice. Home is personal space. House is a structure. Home is where you go back to a family. Hotel is a luxury. Great. Home is personalized. Okay. Now comes home is love. Empty house is stuck money. Oh, I like, I like that. Almal, that's a nice one. One is personal care. Yeah, absolutely. Now this is the trick question. And I want you to take a second to think which of this is your organization? Okay. What comes to your head? Is it a home? Because nothing, nothing wrong. No, all the three are important, right? So there is a home, there is a house, and there is a hotel. And all the three serve three different purposes. All of them are equally important. So what is your organization? Okay. I want you to reflect because. How you think of your organization will determine how you work with people. Yeah. Now, interesting, right? Home is built by people. Uh, house is built by people. Home is created by people. Somebody say, Vivek, good point. Currently, the situation resembles like a hotel that people come in and people go. I think my organization to be a home, but it was possibly could be a, a, a house. Very insightful. Very insightful. Okay. Now you can see, as we look at our organizations, there is what we want it to be, and there is what it is. Okay. Now you must remember that all the three are equally different ways of structuring. All the three can be equally effective. A well-built house can be extremely attractive. It can be attractive for short-time stay people, for long-term stay people. It could be attractive for vacationers. It could be attractive um, for, for several kinds of people. A home is attractive for people who want to put their roots, stay, grow, create. A hotel is attractive for someone who doesn't really, who, who's, so 
a hotel is so attractive because everything is taken care of by someone. And what I'm really doing is having a delightful experience. Okay. Now, um, Dhawal, you said houses where business should be. As with home, we become emotionally attached, whereas in business, it should not be attached emotionally. You know, I just love you guys here on the Kridai uh, program because you just, uh, I'm going to challenge that assumption, okay? And we will talk about it, right? So now I'm going to ask you, um, are you attached to your enterprise? No, as owners and entrepreneurs, no, if you are not attached, who will be attached? Who cares about your organization more than you? Nobody. Nobody. Hmm. You have stake in it. It's your baby. It's your life. Okay. So therefore, it is very nice to think here that I should not be attached. Very good. But in reality, if you are not attached, then how will you create anything? Uh, entrepreneurs are supposed to create. Okay. So you now see. This head and heart division as an entrepreneur. Oh, I should be very business-like, so I should not get emotionally attached. But very interestingly, if it is your business, then how can you not be attached? Hey, Geetendra, I like that, yeah. Attach detachment, huh? someone like this Bhagavad Gita or something like that. Not so easy, no. Yeah, we live everyday lives. So it's very difficult to have this attached to detachment, though I'm completely with you because I am for several entrepreneurs, okay? So what does this attached detachment mean? So we'll come to that, okay? So I want to now get you to think a little bit about your organizations, that it doesn't matter whether it's a house, a home, or a hotel. They all have structures. They all have design, they all have uh, building, they are all brick and mortar, they all have, um, I mean, you know better, why, uh, yeah? So they all have a structure. But it's interesting that whether it is a hotel, whether it is a house, or whether it is a home, in all the three cases, and I want you to reflect because you are in this business, and therefore, I want you to be able to see that. You built, a, a building, it's a house. People walk in, some people like some kind of houses, some people don't like those kind of houses. Okay, And you know it when you're selling it to your customers. Similarly, when you come home, at home, there are structures. Okay, A family has a structure. There are reporting relationships, there are ways of working, there is roles and responsibility, there is punishment and reward, there is incentive, there is everything is there in a family. Okay, so which means home have structures. Hotels, no two hotels are the same. Okay, so if you go to a Taj or you go to an Oberoi, their structure looks the same, but the way they treat you is very different. Both of them are unique. Both of them are different. We will enjoy both the experience, but they are different. Okay. So I think the point I want to leave for you as entrepreneurs, and I hope you will embrace it, is that all organizations have a structure, but the culture, or the feel of the place is created by you. Okay. So, in some ways, what does this mean? This means that what you create in your organization is unique to you. You can borrow systems, you can put software, you can bring uh, hardware, you can you can bring differently. But at the end of the day, remember that your organization is unique. Just as each one of us is unique, one of your organizations is unique. Just as no two individuals are the same, no two organizations are the same. Okay. So I want you to just take a couple of minutes to say, what is unique about your organization? What is unique? Transparency, okay. What else is unique about your organization? Bonding, 
okay self managed teams my organization is a true reflection of myself very nice very nice and uh, what are you sudeep openness very nice self motivated individuals excellent very long time associated team leadership okay so clearly you can see that each one of your organizations is unique okay so just keep this in mind because while you are uh, some of your organizations are continuously evolving great you have core purpose and core values we are like a family employees love to come to office excellent excellent so you can now see that each one of your organizations has its unique culture okay now founder organizations and i'm sure in like in other credai batches you they will be first generation companies they will be second generation companies yeah so each one of your organizations have this distinct unique culture now why is culture important to think about as an entrepreneur because it is something that you have created that culture was created by you it did not happen like an accident yeah no cultures happen by accident cultures are created and then they become deep culture has good bad and ugly okay so it has all of it the good is very very motivated people the sec, uh, the bad is that these motivated people don't allow anybody else to come in and when other people come in their ideas are dismissed okay so while the culture of long standing people in the organization who work together is positive the same set of people will not prevent i will not allow ideas to come from outside okay so i want you to look like us like you and me right we have many strengths but a strength is also our weakness quite in the same way organizations have positive aspects of the culture but they also have negative aspects okay so as entrepreneurs you are struggling to change you don't want to lose the positive but you also want to have, uh, minimize the negative so now you understand why i'm talking about people as so central to the way you think okay so now let me get into things that i find entrepreneurs usually kind of take it for granted i'm now going to give you a bit of feedback after working with thousands of entrepreneurs first and the most important one is that your enterprise is not you okay what does that mean yeah and let me just look at it right that you created this enterprise true or your father created it or your mother created it who it could be you created the enterprise your family or your team of friends who came together to create this enterprise but remember that this enterprise is a legal entity when you raise money for this enterprise you are not raising because of you nobody is giving you money because it is you they are giving you money because of the enterprise the registered entity okay why is this important because most entrepreneurs think they and their enterprise are one and the same okay they are not the moment you start thinking that you are the enterprise your enterprise will reach its level of incompetence why because all of us as human beings have only this much capacity in terms of how far we can grow we need others to challenge us we need people to get us to think differently only when we start thinking differently can we go back and invest in our enterprise in our organizations so for heaven's sake your organization is not you can you imagine if you thought your child is yours if you thought your child is yours you should be keeping it at home forever because if you send outside right the child is at risk yeah entrepreneurs who think 
that their enterprise is theirs. Their org my organization is me. Oh, Professor, there's no difference between me and my organization. I'm very worried when people tell me that because that means your organization has reached your level of incompetence. Yeah. Very, very important. And now you'll understand why I said the title of the session was how do I hire people smarter than you? Because you are the only person who's interested in your organization. Nobody else is. Okay. You created it, you have to think long term about it. Otherwise, nobody else is interested. People come and work with you. People share their ideas and dreams. People give their time and uh, effort. But at the end of the day, thinking long term for the organization is your only responsibility. Okay. Even more interesting, your organization should outlive you. Yeah, because all of us as human beings have limited lifetime. Imagine the Tatas, yeah, that Jamshedji Tata is dead and gone. Jihadi Tata is dead and gone. Now imagine the Tata still continue to exist, right? So the organization should outlive any individual. So now you understand that if you are thinking for the next 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, then who else do you think in your organization is thinking the next 25 years? Yeah, I want you to reflect on this because, and this is the place where I think entrepreneurial organizations don't grow because the entrepreneurs also think 12 months. They also think quarter to quarter. Across your organization, everybody is looking at March 2021. All your plans, all your strategies are for March 2021. Who in your organization is thinking March 2025? Okay. I hope you're now beginning to see why it's important. In your head, because you are the only one who's thinking long-term future for the organization. Okay. Uh, Abhishek, do you think I should pause here and take some questions? Uh, Ma'am, I uh, think that will be a great idea. Um, if we can, uh, Sonamji, if we can just uh, have the Q&A. In fact, give me a lot of uh, insights as usual, ma'am. I should be thinking, just thinking of March about 2025. Yeah, and not about March 2021. That's actually yeah. a great uh, uh, reflection, honestly. Yeah, I mean, even I wasn't kind of, I mean, I kind of was thinking about it. But since I said it, I think some people may have some questions because given the kind of situation that we are in, I just yeah. realized that uh, that could kind of provoke some thinking because uh, people might think that what I what am I saying? You know, in these times, I cannot even think next quarter. How what are you talking about? Kind of a thing. But so that's why maybe we can just open up for a few minutes for some chat questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. I have the question from Niranjan who says, how do we align our goals with individual goals of our staff? OK, OK, good, 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 good. Should I do a little bit of sales pitch and say, come to my class? Okay, so no. <laughs> Our board generally asks for three to five years uh, business scenario, but nothing about people's strategy. Good, good. You know, it is so fascinating, Gitendra. I, I think you have some insights there. Uh, what, uh, you know, it's so true that the board asks for strategy and they, you give a business strategy, okay? And I have found so interesting that you formulate the whole strategy, the implementation of strategy. Now, just think about it. The strategy implementation process is a completely people process and change management process. Strategy formulation is done and you have the strategy and the whole strategy implementation is change management and is people centered. So we have these beautiful strategies and I'd like for some of you to go back and look at all the strategies that you have put in place. And look at how much were you actually able to deliver. 
And 99 out of 100 times, you could not deliver it, not because you didn't have a good strategy. It's just that you didn't have people to execute the strategy. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. Um, Very likely said. Yeah, it's a, that's the challenge now. How do we achieve the balance between short-term and long-term goals? What if our short-term goals contradict our long-term goals, especially in these pandemic times? Of course it will. Of course it will contradict. You must remember that. Okay, and I'm going to give an example, and I'll constantly keep comparing uh, your personal lives to the organization, right? Um, let me uh, just quickly give you an example, because during the pandemic, the last four months, believe you me, this must be almost the 14th time that I'm talking to entrepreneurs and my slide is not the same. OK, and so you can see the kind of changes that are going on in my head as I'm addressing every batch. So uh, the first and the most important one is that all of us in the business have not been profitable one or two years. Yeah, all of us have been through that situation. But our businesses have continued to exist. And the businesses have existed because you've got something right. So this notion that stable and long term is a myth that you've got into your head. All businesses all over the world, as they go through cycles, go through losses, have years where they don't make the revenues. But does that mean they don't outlive and last long? Not true. Not true. Right? So that's why when you're looking at it, there is a need to look at long term. And if you constantly keep focusing on the long term, a lot of your questions and discussions, because all the people in your organization are focusing short term. They're trying to see how to fix. Okay? So when everybody is thinking short term and you're able to see long term, you can actually get them to align in what they are doing better. Okay. Now, this is kind of tied to the question that Prakash Sharma has asked on, what do you mean, madam, when you say your enterprise is not you? Okay. What do I mean? I mean that if your enterprise was you, okay, can you imagine this whole pandemic you will be thinking of tomorrow? Why? Because you are concerned about yourself. But remember that the business is a legal entity. If you are not there for two weeks, the business still goes on. So which means you are not your business. Yeah, I hope you are able to see this because this, this distinction, Prakash, is the most important thing. Most important thing. Everything else is not the thing. So, how long can I stay away from my business? And the business will still continue to run independent of whether I am there or not. That is enterprise. That is the organization. If your organization cannot exist without you even for one day, then forget it because your organization's biggest risk is you. Absolutely, ma'am. So I hope you're really getting this distinction because entrepreneurs, if they get this distinction, everything else is done. Everything else is done because then you're beginning to ask, okay, if I'm not there, who is going to be there making decisions on behalf of the organization? Is that person the right person to make those decisions? Does the person actually understand the business and where I'm thinking from in the long run to make that decision? Yeah. So you now see the questions that change automatically. Have I given that power person the power to be able to make decisions? Yeah. So all of these questions come only when you think I am not my organization. If you think I am my organization, then the organization will live, succeed, grow as long as you are there. As long as you are there. Many of you must be young entrepreneurs, so which means in a country like India, you should be looking at opportunities everywhere. You're not going to be wedded to one business in a country that's going to grow over the next 30, 40 years, right? So then why would you say that my enterprise is me? Absolutely. So then in which case, every entrepreneur must always be prepared with a second line of defense, 100%. 
Actually, I would evaluate you as an entrepreneur only when you have a strong second and a third line, not just a second line, a third line. Otherwise, till then, no, when people come and tell me, oh, Professor, I do so many crores, so many rubbish. Why? Because you are your biggest risk. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of therefore saying that if you are your biggest risk, then why are you creating an organization? Huh. So that's really the idea when I said that as entrepreneurs, your second line, your third line is your most important contribution to the organization. Yeah. Some really good questions. Huh? Some really good questions. Yeah. Is there any last question before I move ahead? How to identify employees who will stay? Rahul, why should they stay with you? Yeah. I'm going to ask you this question and you better be prepared to answer and you please sit down, go home and think about it, which is that why should somebody work for you? What do you give them? And why should they want to make a career with you? What is it that you offer them that they can't get anywhere in the market? Unless you have answer for all of these questions, no, don't ask how to identify employees. Being the younger second third generation, many attendees here will probably be the second or third line of defense. Any advice for us on how to manage the enterprise fourth and fifth line? Of course, of course. Okay. So I think there are two things and then there are several of these guys in this young um, uh, group of uh, office bearers who I have taught so I can tell you. First one is that your first and second, third line, right? Why should they trust you? Yeah. Huh? What have you shown that is capable that uh, that is um, that uh, you have to bring to this uh, family business? Yeah. If you're third generation. OK, what are you contributing? So which means first you need to be clear. What is it that you can complement your first and second line? And 19 out of 100 times you're thinking, oh, what can I do differently? Rubbish. They have run the business for 40 years, 50 years and they have run it well. So why should they listen to you? So first look at how can I complement what is happening in the business? How can I add value to the most vulnerable part of the business? Start thinking from there on how do I complement the business? Then you talk about how can I come into the business? Yeah, I think that mindset for second, third, fourth generation is very important. Otherwise, one entitlement. Oh, I am so-and-so son, so I should come into the business. Why? What else do you have as credentials? Nothing. So unless you have credentials, how can you have credibility? If you don't have credibility, why should your employees listen to you? Yeah. I worked for 35 years in this company. I worked with your father. I worked with your uncle. I know, or your aunt or your mother or whoever it is. And I know the business better than you. Now, that's what most of you will be struggling with. No. So what can you bring to them? Other than the fact that you're a son or daughter. Why should somebody respect you for being a son and daughter? Hmm. Please, please think about this because the only thing I can tell you is that when you come in as an entrepreneur, as a third generation entrepreneur, you have a legacy. And the legacy has both positive and negative. The legacy is that you have to build, you don't have to struggle. That's the positive. The negative is that you carry the burden of the legacy. So which means you have to be innovative, which doesn't mean you have to be innovative. OK, I told you your enterprise is not you. So which means you don't have to be this creative, innovative person. You have to be able to spot ideas from people that are innovative. OK, so. Are there any exceptions to this rule, such as successful companies that hinge on the reputation of their prolific founder? Um, so you see, we should not minimize, uh, Rishi, the role of uh, founders' footprints in lives of organizations. We should not underestimate. But having said that, remember that Apple was Steve Jobs. Okay? So... Not, and Apple out has outlived Steve Jobs. Hmm. So 
All that I want to leave you with is that outstanding businesses handle transition from the founder to the next generation effortlessly. There will be a struggle for a while because the founder is almost God. So therefore, there will be a period of time for transition. But after that, good, solid enterprises outlive the founder, outlive the founder. So I'm going to pause here and not take any more questions. Just go back to the next few slides. So, and then kind of um, come back uh, to, uh, to taking some questions, okay? So if there are questions, just keep them with you and then I'll come back. I'm not taking performance related questions and goals related, goal setting related questions because I didn't intend to do that for this session uh, because the focus of the session is really on how how are you going to look at selection, retaining, you know, that that's the piece that I'm focused on now. Yeah. So here are the kind of questions you have to think. Okay. So let's spend some time looking at this. From a people perspective, what are your weakest areas today? The pandemic has shown so clearly. What are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? Okay. So in the last five months, what have you figured out about your weaknesses from a people perspective? Competence, expertise, which are the weak things in your organization? Some of you on chat? Very good. Role, role clarity missing. Very good. So we had a lot of people doing all kinds of things and overlapping, which we had not seen earlier, but now we are beginning to see. Decision making. Very good. Okay. So at what level, who should be making what kind of decision? Decision is really a problem. Very good. So which means you have more people somewhere, less people somewhere. Very good. Then you figured out that measurement metrics not defined at each level. Very good. Okay. So we don't know what we are measuring. Yeah. So we don't have it at every level. So which means we don't know who's accountable for what. What else have you figured out is your weakest area. Goals. Yeah. And okay. So I think that goals is coming many, many times. I'm just going to make one statement and leave it here for you to think about. Okay. So as entrepreneurs, why should you focus on organization goals? Okay, I'll, I'll pick it up a little bit because I want to leave you thinking about it. Is that when you have a strategy and you're going to execute the start strategy, remember that strategy and performance are two sides of the same coin. Okay, let me let me just okay build the block. So that because it's a very complex, I would have taken two hours in the classroom to do this. But since many of you are asking this, I don't want you to go back like not having an answer. In like five minutes, what I would do in two and a half hours class. So all organizations need to perform. Our strategy is a roadmap of performance. Okay. However, once you have a strategy, how do I translate the strategy so that the last person in the organization knows what they have to do to be able to get the results for that strategy? Okay. So, as entrepreneurs, you're saying, how is my strategy being understood by the last person in the chain that marketing executive who's going to make a sale that project manager who's supervising the site that electrician who's going to go and fix a problem with the customer how do i make sure that every single one of them understand how what they are doing is tied to 
the goal. Okay? That is really what you're going, doing through your performance management process. A performance management process is nothing more than the strategy translated to the last employee in the organization in a way that they can act. In a way that they can act. So what's your role as an entrepreneur? Your role as an entrepreneur is to make sure that you know how that strategy is translating. You need to be clear. Do we want to increase market share? Do we want to increase revenues? Do we want to reduce cost? What is our focus? Because they'll all pull people in different directions. Okay. So as an entrepreneur, you need to be clear what it is that you want that last employee to be known. Okay. I hope you now understand you should see goal setting within this large frame. A goal setting process is nothing more than a vehicle to translate your organization strategy into real performance. Okay, so I hope you got that. So now think about goal setting and everything within that lens. Okay, so we now have what are our weakest areas. Okay, now let us look at one more thing this COVID has done, and I don't know how many of you are thinking about it. It has shown who are solid performers, who are average performers, and who are below average performers. Have, are you able to make that distinction very clearly? Have you been able to make that? Let's hear some responses. Not really? Very much, very much Professor. Huh. Uh, but uh, uh, Gitega, you're not able to make that very clearly? Yeah, Where, what's stopping? Are you able to see solid high performers very easily? Yeah. Okay. A lot of people are saying that yes, they have not, they are able to see. So let me ask you have you been able to see non performers clearly? Have you been able to see non performance very clearly? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you are able to distinguish between high performers and non performers, that's 50% of your problem solved. Okay. That's 50% of your problem solved. Yeah, very good, very good. So if you are able to see that Ravish and Gitendra, 50% of your problem is solved. And now you have to step back and ask, have I given solid performers? Yes, Prakash, all these boys and men. Yes, correct. Men are staying, boys are gone. Yes, I agree with you completely. The differentiator. The interesting thing is, have you given those solid performers, high performers, what kind of opportunities have you given them in the past? N most entrepreneurs that I'm meeting in the last four months, five months are telling me that, they're telling me two things. One, Professor, I only gave them so strong functional responsibility. I never groomed them for organizational responsibility. They were good at it, so I gave more responsibility and they are now taking charge of the whole thing. But I now realize that this person, I could have actually expanded their roles. Okay, they, I could have moved them to other parts. I could have got them to do many other things. Now, that's one feedback I'm receiving. Okay, the second one is that some of the solid performers, you know, people are showing up as performers, actually... I don't know what else they are capable of because I have never looked at them like that. Are you any of you facing this problem? Yeah. So it is very strange because we have some good performers. They have been carrying the weight. They are doing very well. But I have never applied my head in terms of thinking what opportunities should I create for them. Okay. So this is one kind of a challenge entrepreneurs are telling me. The second kind of a challenge that they are telling me how come I did not know that these people were poor performers? How come nobody told me that they are poor performers? How come I did not know? Okay. Now, the interesting question is that, how come? So, one of the questions I was asking is, did you ask for that information about who are the people who are non-performers? People would have come and complained about them to you. 
in the past. When somebody comes and complains about someone else, you have to listen a little bit more because we often think they have some interpersonal problems. They may be also the case, but many times people are telling you that there's a problem with what they are contributing in the organization and I don't like it. That's why I'm coming to complain to you. Okay, so pay a little more attention, listen a little more to performance. I think that should be your learning from the COVID situation. Am I giving opportunities for solid performers? Am I keeping my ears open to identify poor performance? Okay, now this is 50% of the problem solved. Okay, 50% on the of problems in entrepreneurial organizations is in the middle. Okay, and the beauty about the middle is you yourselves know that they can do everyday jobs, but we don't know whether they have the potential to do other jobs or whether they don't have potential. COVID, I think this situation is a great opportunity, great opportunity for you to test this out. Okay, forget about the top, forget about the bottom. Look at this middle 50%, figure out who is the 20% in the middle that can move up? 25% in the middle that can go up. If you have done that right, that's 80% of your problem solved. Okay. Why am I mentioning this? Because during when the business begins to start to pick up, you'll be in deep trouble. You'll be in deep trouble. Okay. So for those of you who said, my business is my home, this tough exercise you have to do today. That's your job as an entrepreneur if you want your enterprise to succeed. Okay. Now, why do some employees become non-performers during their strength? No, many times the problem is not with hiring. The problem is that we are not holding them accountable. We are not giving them feedback. We are not catching their uh, hold of their rewards. We are, so all of this attention. So poor performers become poor performers or non-performers because the skill that is needed. Typically, I have seen in my life four reasons. One, they don't, the skill with which they came in, you don't need that skill anymore. Okay. In your kind of organizations, there are plenty because there's so much of technology coming in. Okay, earlier, if you had to go do a sale, you still need people, but you have to go somewhere. You are needed a lot of people uh, doing legwork, but now there are multiple models in which you are selling. Okay, now people don't have the capability to scale. You had an administration manager earlier who was very good as long as it was all manual. Now you have moved into a software and the person does not have capability to uh, for a computer. Okay, so that's the first kind where people don't have skill. Second one is that people don't have knowledge. We now have, we are operating in 10 states and we need to know the regulation in all the 10 states. The person is very good in Karnataka or Maharashtra, but they don't know for the rest of the country. What do you do? Okay, so now that is the second one and you've decided to centralize everything all work projects, legal work, compliance will happen centrally. Now, what will you do? Knowledge is not there. The person is very good. The knowledge is not there. And the person does not have the ability to learn, to be uh, to understand what happens in 15 states. Still, the person is very good, except that the person is not very good in compliance anymore. Third one, person has wrong attitude. Huh? Five years ago, they were your star performer. Today, they are your non-performer. But the fact is, they still think they are star performer. Yeah. I had a good attitude uh, when I was working with customers. But now I have moved to some kind of pre-sales marketing department. I don't want to be here. Wrong attitude. There are plenty in organizations. And last but not the least is people who should not be there in that job because they have no motivation. They are treating it like a job. Okay. Now, if these people are competent, you can put them somewhere. If they are incompetent, you really don't have a choice. Okay. How do we give the constructive feedback to someone in executive management? Look, constructive feedback, Rishi, should go for everybody. 
Okay. At the end of the day, remember what I told you, performance is between strategy that you had formulated to the strategy that was delivered. What is the gap? That gap is the constructive feedback that has to go to everybody. So please do not separate between executive management and non-executive management. Everybody in your organization should receive feedback because they are all contributing to the overall goal of the organization. So feedback giving should be a habit is a habit in the organization, okay? People will not seek feedback. You're giving feedback because it is bothering you. Why will I come and seek feedback? Yeah, I have no reason to seek feedback. Why will I come and seek you feedback from you? Because then you will tell me I'm not doing well. Do I want to listen to that? No, I don't want to listen to that. So people are not going to come and ask feedback. You are giving them feedback because you are worried that their behavior is impacting your business. Okay, so that's how you have to look at feedback as an entrepreneur. Next, difficult, difficult questions huh? on this slide. Who is the competitor that you admire most? Mm, difficult question, no, for entrepreneurs. We all think we are doing very well in our businesses. We are great. Yeah, of course you're great. But remember that someone else is greater. There's always someone better than you. The moment you assume that you are great, your, your, your downfall is begun because that's arrogance. There'll always be at least half a dozen people better than you. Who are those people who are better than me? What is it that they are doing differently that they continue to be better than me? As long as you have people better than you, you have someone to look up to. For those of you who come from organizations where you are already such a big brand and you are a second or a third generation of such a big brand, remember, you only compete with yourself. So are you the organization today that you were five years ago? Just go and take a look at the um, uh, uh, digital history that rests in the website of customer feedback and it will give you a very good indication of who you are today. Okay, go to the glass door and it will tell you if you're a large co company on the glass door, go and look at it. Your employees are exactly telling you what your organization is. Okay, so if you are as long as you have competitors, you have an opportunity to look at them and grow. When you don't have competitors and you become a competitor, you become the number one, then you only have to look at your own self and get better. Okay. Last but not the least, how do you see your organization 10 years from now? My sincere request to each one of you is that after this session, just go back and do the fourth ex uh, question. Okay. Um, I've been I've been doing a I've been doing a lot of reading and I've been talking to entrepreneurs who've been through really difficult situations worse than the kind of situation that we are going through now, and it's kind of interesting that the way the brain works is that the more you feed it short term, the more it becomes short term. The more you feed it long term thinking, the more it begins to think long term. Okay, so this is the paradox of training your brain. Okay. So as everybody around you is saying, oh, what's going to happen? COVID numbers going up. Oh, do, 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 do. You see what happens to you here? It impacts you. Okay. Because you are also thinking like them. And if as an entrepreneur, you think like everybody who's around you, then why are you an entrepreneur? Yeah. So in some ways, I really, really urge you. This is going to be the most difficult exercise. I hope you write it somewhere and keep it so that 10 years from now, you can go and take that sheet of paper or look at it somewhere on your computer, store it well, because during times when everybody is thinking short term, you need to be able to think long term. Because unless you are able to think long term, you can't provide a vision or direction for the organization. How much more time do I have? I think I've overshot, no? Abhishek? We have another 10 minutes, ma'am. We can take another 10 minutes. It's okay. So I've yeah. used the last slide. Yeah, because I thought I had overshot quite badly on, uh, I mean, I couldn't see on the computer my uh, the time. So that's why. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think then I'm good. So I'll, let me then go to the very last uh, slide. You now see why I have been talking. Are you hiring people better than you? 
because all the questions that I was preparing so far, I was asking you to reflect about. If you have to grow in the future, you have to think about the kind of future that you want. And the moment you start thinking about the kind of future that you want, you'll also be asking, who are the people who are there currently who will grow into that future? And the moment you've addressed who are the people who will grow with you into that future, you also know what kind of opportunities you need to provide them with. You also know what kind of gaps are there. You also know that what you should do to yourself for you to be able to grow. Okay. So now you see, it's not about finding the people and bringing them into your organization. That's the job of your HR if you are a big organization. Yeah. Otherwise, finance, admin, those people will do, you know, call for CVs. That's it. No. As an entrepreneur, you are searching for people every day of your life. It's like you're searching for a customer every day of your life because that customer you don't know exists where. So as an entrepreneur, you every meeting for you potentially, every person you're meeting is a potential customer. Similarly, every person that you're meeting is a potential person who can give you access to a set of people who could be better than you or who will be able to deliver on the vision that you have. Okay, so therefore, are you hiring people better than you? As I meet more and more people, am I actually scouting and saying, is this the kind of person that I'd like to have in my organization two years from now? Yeah. And I've worked with some amazing people in my life. I have worked with some incredible people in my life who are great entrepreneurs who've just got this ability to say, and, and, and I remember one of them, a very good friend of mine was telling me, Vasanti, you know, this is the kind of person I want to hire for the organization, but right now I can't afford but in one and a half years time, this is the person I want. I mean, that's it. So it's not about, it's not about getting people. It's about thinking about the kind of people you want to get. Because the more you think about the kind of people you want to get, the more it will translate in terms of looking for the people who fit that. Right? Otherwise, if you don't have that in your mind, then you will hire the person who turned up not the person you want, okay? The person you who turned up and you hired is the person who will do work for today. You remember? That's what I'm saying. It's the entrepreneur, enterprise. As long as you think for the enterprise, you're looking for people. If you think for yourself, you're hiring whoever comes to you today. Second one, entrepreneurs in particular are the most vulnerable to this problem. All the time, they keep telling me. Why should the person listen to you? Yeah? If the person has to listen to you, um, then why did you hire them? You put on machine, no? Now you get very good, uh, like that, um, what is that? Um, Echo, no? Amazon Echo, eh? that Google, that, what is that called? I've forgotten that. Uh, Alexa. If you ask it to play music, no? What is that? Alexa. Ah, Alexa, sorry. Ah, then Alexa, you say, play the song. And then Alexa will play. Okay? Then you are like one puppet. Yeah? Pulling strings everywhere. If you want that kind of people, you'll get that kind of people only and your organization will grow to your level of incompetence. If you get people better than you, they will challenge you. And many times you have to turn around and say, yes, I'm wrong. No, I didn't take that into consideration. No, I didn't think about it. I am sorry. Your vocabulary will change the way you talk. Huh? So now you see what a lot of problem. Because they will also have expectations from you. They'll expect that you will review. They'll expect that you will take meetings seriously. They'll expect that you come with them when they ask you for something. Now we have problem, no? You can't say my way, highway. Yeah? So entrepreneurs have this problem. You can't have anybody better than you because then you have to listen to what they are saying and you may have to change your mind. Yeah. So what we do, we want to hire great people. We bring them and then tell them, you listen to me. Some of them who don't want to listen to you will say, sorry, boss, I'm going. Others who stay back will adjust their mind and become exactly like you. And you will say, oh, God, I got this man with so much of money. I paid so much and brought them from somewhere competition. What happened? They are like this so mediocre. Our, my own people are better than you. 
because they start thinking about what they had done in the other organization. Okay, now you see why I said entrepreneur enterprise. I always say this. Bingo. If you're thinking about yourself, you're not going to think about the enterprise. If you're thinking about the enterprise, you're then going to be looking for that person who's better than you, who can provide you inputs, which will help to shape the business. Okay. To leave that today, as I see your sector and the way it's panning out, right? Earlier, we would always talk. And today, I'm sure in this hard pressed times, all our focus is on finance, projects, execution. Okay. But it's interesting that in the sector, I'm beginning to see more and more that the right person can actually be truly the biggest differentiator. Yeah. And I've had several I've heard in my classroom. So I do believe that that right person finding someone better than you is going to be key to the way you actually run business. And with that, I'm going to pause and stop. Is there anything I should have covered? Uh, Abhishek, uh, others who are uh, uh, co team members who attended me, anything you think I should have covered? Perfect, ma'am. Absolutely bingo perfect. For one second, I was literally transported into the class. Uh, pin drop silence. Uh, just an <laughs> interesting anecdote I would like to share. We had 87% of the members fully attentive in this entire session. And uh, that is incredibly remarkable, I must uh, mention. Uh, before I uh, go to the next uh, this thing, I'm quickly request uh, Sonam to put up the poll. Uh, Sonam, uh, can I have the polls up, please? Request all of you to this simple two questions. Uh, how smart do I look? Uh, and uh, do I come with a better kurta the next time? So these are the two questions that you need to ask, I mean, to answer. Uh, and for all of you who say, yes, I look very smart, uh, a five-star chocolate is on its way. So uh, just to bring a little humor to the table, uh, excellent uh, session, ma'am. Uh, a couple of very interesting points that I have just made note of. Uh, organizations have structures and entrepreneurs act create the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that for me was quite a reflective thought which kept coming. But the biggest thought is who in my organization is thinking for March 2025? Uh, mm. Like you very rightly pointed out uh, later in your uh, this thing, all of us are thinking short term. How am I going to survive August? How am I going to see the end of 2020? Yeah. Whereas actually our focus has to be what is my organization going to be uh, yeah. doing in March 2025? So I think yeah. that is a very, very, very big uh, uh, learning uh, mm -hmm. thing for me. And like you very rightly summed it up, I need the perfect people. I need to hire the smart ones who can ask me, what are you doing, Abhishek? I think what you're doing is wrong. I can tell you from my personal experience um, post IM Bangalore, I have uh, taken on board a couple of them, uh, somebody uh, even with sweat equity, and I can tell you that they are making a huge difference. Uh, uh, of course, it was a bit of uh, ego shattering thing to tell him, uh, I think I made a mistake in this project. Uh, yeah. I goofed up, but I, I'm telling you, Post that, he uh, the respect that he has for me and the respect that I have for him yeah. uh, uh, grows up tremendously. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, um, Abhishek, I should tell you uh, that um, one of the um, one of the interesting things uh, when I was uh, talking to um, uh, who, I don't know which group was this electronics manufacturers or whatever. I was addressing them. This was a group in Chandigarh, hmm. close to about 700 entrepreneurs that were there in that meet. And um, I was, so when I made this statement and uh, somebody said uh, 2025, when I said, and remember that was a very early stage of the lockdown. And um, my, my one reflection was that, and I must tell you since March 29th is when I did my first session. And every week I have addressed entrepreneurs, okay, almost every week. And one of the things that struck me is, and it still strikes me today, you know, um, at that point in time, I didn't have the data, but I just kept saying that, look, we should not 
um, uh, uh, so in the absence of how unpredictable the times are, okay, um, as entrepreneurs, we have to be prepared for four ways of how the economy will grow. Yeah, four ways. And I am interested in this growth and all of that, not from, I mean, you know that I don't think anything other than people. So in my head, it was important to ask, what would happen to your organizations if the economy, let's assume, took a V, which is what CII is saying now, okay? I'm, I'm not sure still there, but if it became a V, right? And what do I know from previous work, the research that I've done? both 2002 as well as 2010, both the uh, crisis, whether it's the dot-com bust or whether it is the financial crisis, you won't believe the industry could not cope with a V. So what will happen? You'll start poaching from competition. And as everybody poaches from competition, people cost will just hit the roof. Okay. Now, this is something we've seen a V and CII says that the country is going to recover with a V. Hmm? So I get very worried when it is a V. I'm, I'm petrified when it is a V because from a people management perspective, your organizations will just go for a toss and your costs will go haywire. Hmm? So if you have to prepare for a V, it has to be today because V recovery means 2022 20, January, you're there. Hmm? Now let us assume that it takes the uh, role of a W, like the pandemic, okay? So small drop, steep improvement, the FMCG sector is going through that right now. And then a uh, um, they've been Drop able to up. kind of plateau the curve a little bit, but there are several other sectors which are going through hotels. Now that W is the most difficult one from a people management perspective because you need a threshold of production. Manufacturing guys are telling me that. They need a threshold of production to be able to cater to the demand. Now that threshold is not guaranteed equally. And this e disequilibrium and equilibrium, they're not able to get it. They're not able to get it. So cash flow problems are just chaotic. Okay. So the moment you have cash flow problems, you will convert more and more people into variable cost. You will hire more and more contractors. When you keep doing this, and at some point in time, the W becomes a V, you suddenly recover, realize that you have more contractors than permanent stuff. Okay. And then you, okay. So whether it's a V, whether it's a W, whether it's a U, okay. U means, you know, industries will have to lay off people, you know, it's 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 a it's a very different one. Assuming it's a long L, then how do you actually kind of uh, make that co combination? Yeah, of how many people do I keep? How many people do I uh, put on contract? When can I bring them back? Yeah. So I think when I look at that, no, I think the pain that we are visualizing for this COVID is is primarily because we are unable to predict the people impact that the various curves, growth curves will have in organizations as well as the country. Yeah. So that's why it becomes important to ask this question 2025. Absolutely, ma'am. Sorry for that big long answer, but that's the context in which a lot of my statements were coming from. Okay. Absolutely. So I'm really glad you raised that. Yeah. Yeah. A big thank you to you, uh, Professor Vasanti. Uh, we have had an amazing session, amazing session with you today. Um, uh, do hold on because the next session is going to be on negotiation. How do I negotiate with other people? And that too in today's Zoom world and uh, over video conferencing. And it's going to be none other than Professor Shankar who's going to take that. And trust me, I have been in one of his sessions he squeezes everything from you. <laughs> so the entire juice gets squeezed off is one session I will really be looking forward to, which this time is on the next Friday, the 14th of August, the same time, 4.30 to 6 as usual. And uh, before I say uh, final adieu, um, a big thank you to everybody at the Kradai Youth Wing uh, and the Women's Wing who have uh, brought about this entire uh, uh, collaboration with IAM this time. Uh, and if you have uh, any of your questions uh, which you want us to uh, ask to Professor, uh, you can send it off to the Kradai, uh, to Sonamji uh, at Kradai uh, National Office and she will be more than happy to uh, send this to a professor and then we can uh, take this forward. Uh, professor, uh, thank you. Uh, 
learned as usual a lot of that uh, still um, miss uh, your white sneakers and the way you just uh, keep running about the entire uh, classroom <laughs> I was thinking twice whether should I bring it up or not, but that yes, of trust course. me, yeah, because uh, in fact, uh, the way I described you to my wife was this one professor who talks about organization uh, behavior and um, uh, wears white sneakers and looks yeah. as if you know she's playing tennis in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I see some of my, uh, are, were there some of them from my class? A lot of them from your class, ma'am. I know. Lot of Look at all that. What are you doing? Yeah, again in this <laughs> class, you're not tired. Huh? <laughs> Gosh, you guys Madam, really have some enthusiasm. Uh, learning should never stop. Yes, I Absolutely. agree. Oh, no. Yeah. Look at, I know so many of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, there's somebody from KMM Pune. Almal. Okay. 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 Surendra, I really like you. Yeah, you're not tired of my class. Okay. <laughs> That's why you invited me again here. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks. And, Thank a, you. and a very good evening and a goodbye to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.